All right, Red Nation, today we're going to talk about all the basics you need to know about how mammography works coming up here at How Radiology Works. Mammography is used for breast cancer screening and also for diagnostic imaging of breast cancer. The idea here is we want to image the breast. We're using the minimal radiation dose such that we can still confidently make a diagnosis. And here's a picture of mammography that I found online. I'm going to go through several reasons to why this is a bad picture throughout our little discussion here. But just take a look at this picture. See why you think this is not an accurate representation of how mammography is really done in the clinic. And we're going to go through that along the way. We're imaging the breast, both of the breasts, and then from a couple different views. So the top-down view we call cranial caudal. So they just call that CC. And then we have a view where the x-ray tube is in the middle and then going towards the outside, towards the lateral side. So medial, lateral, and then it's called oblique because it's a rotated plane from one of our standard reference planes. So those are the two common ones you're going to see, a cranial caudal and a medial lateral oblique. And then typically they're going to be presented like this. And again, like our standard diagnostic imaging, the left and the right is switch. So the one that's on your left is the right breast and the one that's on your right is the left breast. And you can see it's definitely expected to have more tissue outside of the breast in the image for the medial lateral oblique as well to have a relatively similar coverage here between the two views and to make sure that you're covering the nipple all the way into the chest wall. So within the images, we're gonna be looking for a few different things. Microcus microcusifications are something that show up well on x-ray imaging and can correlate with disease progression. It's not a guarantee if you have microcusifications that there is disease, but it's definitely something that you wanna take into account during the clinical read. While microcusifications are what we call a higher contrast structure, they're very small, but they're relatively high contrast from the background. There's other things that are relatively lower contrast such as what's called architectural distortion. The tissues are actually getting moved physically, resulting in reshaping of the tissue itself, which can be seen, and that's why it's called distortion. Also, masses, especially spiculated masses coming off, can be indicative of cancer. So these are the types of things we're looking at in the breast images on mammography. So we need both high resolution, high contrast structures, and then on the other hand, we need low contrast structures as well to be able to see and do this both diagnostically and from a screening standpoint. So from a screening standpoint, it has to be at a low radiation dose. Here's the setup of our mammography system. We've talked about other x-ray systems and about CT systems. So at a high level, it's the same thing where you have an x-ray tube and then you have an image receptor, which is underneath the anatomy, which is being imaged here. And we'll talk about the things that are a little bit different on our x-ray system. So first off, our x-ray tube looks a little funny, right? It actually took a tube, instead of having it be straight on, the tube is actually rotated a bit of an angle. And this is done such that there's this kind of unique geometry where the center here of the beam right here is actually going down right parallel to the wall, to the chest wall here. And that way you don't have a divergent beam that's going into the patient's body, which would be actually giving the patient dose, but which we wouldn't get measurements for. That's one difference in mammography compared with our other x-ray and CT systems. But we have similar things. We have a filter, which comes after the port. So again, the electrons generate the photons. Those photons come down from the anode. They then go through our filter, which we'll talk about is tr traditionally a K-edge filter. Then a collimator, that collimator, just like that X-ray and CT, is actually going to shape the width of the beam. Then the beam is coming out here. This beam is actually then going to pass through the compression paddle. We'll talk about the reasons why we want to have the compression paddle for optimal imaging of the breast. The X-ray is then passed through the anatomy of interest here, which is the breast. Through our grid, we can have a grid in order to preferentially stop the scatter. 
then onto our detector, and then we might have a photo timer for essentially automatic exposure of the X-ray acquisition. So then these things are all mounted on an arm, and you can see in the picture the arm there, and there, that's what allows the system to actually do that rotation so that we can get our different views, as well as on modern systems that tomosynthesis can be done. So for each view, you can actually do a tomosynthesis acquisition in order to get what is called a 3D image of the breast, but what I call a 2.5D image of the breast. You can see our video on tomosynthesis to see why. Another thing to keep in mind with the geometry for our X-ray is that the X-ray flux will be highest right towards the chest wall here, and then it's going to be relatively constant, and then it's going to fall off as you go away. And the nice thing is that kind of corresponds with the anatomy as well, wherein you'll have traditionally a lower amount of attenuation out here towards the nipple where the breast is smaller, and you'll have a higher amount of attenuation in here towards the chest wall. The breast is actually compressed by a compression panel right here. And the reasons that we want to compress the breast have to do with reducing the dose in our imaging. So this is a straight on view. Imagine you had a breast which was not compressed and that the x-rays were coming down from the top here. You might get a profile for your signal on your detector that looks something like this wherein there's actually a lower signal here in the middle, a higher signal out here at the borders. And that's because you're actually passing through less tissue at the sides. And if you compare that with a compressed acquisition, you can see that there's actually going to be a smaller difference between the signal at the outside and at the inside because it's a more uniform amount of breast tissue that is actually going to be passed through. That signal on the detector looks something like this. If you see our video on dynamic range, you remember that essentially you want to minimize the dynamic range of your acquisition. This was even more so true when we had film-based acquisitions, but the dynamic range of this acquisition is smaller because the essential distance from the lowest to the highest attenuation that we're looking at on the detector is actually smaller in the case of compression. We can also see that it helps with contrast. But if you think about having the contrast is actually the differential signal between two different regions. So if you had one region of tissue within there that was different than the background tissue, then you look at the contrast, you're talking about the difference in comparison with the background. So if you had something which had relatively similar value, it's actually going to have higher contrast when the background is actually smaller. So there's less background tissue path here because it's been compressed, and hence you're going to have a higher contrast in your images there. There's also going to be a reduction in the potential for motion when the breast is compressed. So this is just a straightforward thing. If you've seen our video on motion in X-ray and CT, in X-ray, it generally leads to artifacts, much like in photography, where there's blurring in the images. Additionally, scatter is reduced in the case of a compressed breast. And this is because the likelihood of scatter is going to be similar throughout the volume. So as the X-rays have to pass through a longer path length here, they're going to have a higher chance of scattering in comparison if they're passing through a shorter path length of tissue right here in the case of the compressed breast. So if you've seen our video on scatter, you'll remember scatter overall leads to a haze and a reduction in the image quality and the contrast in our X-ray imaging. So you want to reduce the scatter in your images. This is one way to do that effectively. Finally, here's uh, that bad picture that I talked about. So number one, the breast isn't compressed in that picture that I talked about. And then also you'll see that the x-rays are actually coming the wrong direction in that little picture. And they're, they're coming actually straight into the patient and they're actually going to go through the patient and they're not going to be measured to a great extent in this little picture because there's no detector over here sitting inside the patient, right? This is a better schematic here wherein you can see that the breast is actually compressed. It's probably not showing it's still truly accurate as far as the amount of compression.
But when that compression is applied, there's actually tissue which is pulled away from the chest wall to help with muscle visualization to make sure that you're capturing the whole breast. And as far as the geometry of that x-ray tube, like we talked about in our video on the line focus principle, the actual size of the focal spot is dependent on the projection of those electrons hitting the anode, and then they're gonna come down, go through the patient as photons, and then interact with the detector. So it's basically a geometric relationship for that projection. And that projection, because this tube is tilted at this angle, can see that the projection right here is actually gonna be wider. And if you look at, this is the angle right here of the anode. And because of the angle right there of the anode, the projection onto the points over here is actually going to be smaller. In general, you'll have a reference down the middle, which is kind of a representative resolution. And then your resolution in that direction is gonna be reduced as you go towards the chest wall and is gonna be improved as you go towards the nipple. Like we talked about, we have both high contrast and lower contrast features that we're looking at in these images. And a low contrast feature could actually be a glandular region, which then has a carcinoma right inside of it. So in general, you'll see the attenuation that's being plotted here as a function of energy shows that it's definitely gonna be possible to visualize the fat. The fat is gonna be looking darker. The glandular tissue will be looking brighter because fat is in general lower attenuating. The glandular tissue in comparison with the carcinoma, you can see that the difference really only resides in the x-ray attenuation coefficients which is what you're going to see is actually the sum of those x-ray attenuation coefficients on our detector. The difference is really only at energies less than 30 keV. So in general, taking x-ray images, if you want to look at the soft tissue contrast, is going to be very ineffective if you use higher energies like those we use for standard diagnostic x-ray or CT imaging. This is why your x-ray spectra for a mammography system is going to be really tailored to that type of acquisition. If you remember from our video on how the x-ray tube works, we have a video on Bremsstrahlung and characteristic radiation. Check that one out if you haven't seen it already. But at a high level, you're banging those electrons hard into the anode. And inside the anode, Bremsstrahlung is what's called breaking radiation. And it's going to have something like this if you plot the number of photons, and that's how likely it is for those events to happen. But there's actually going to be filtration as those photons are leaving the anode material themselves, and then as they're passing through the window, or what we called the port earlier, on the tube. So you're actually going to get a filtered spectra that looks something like this. This is what your X-ray spectra looks like. If you had just Bremsstrahlung, in reality, you have characteristic radiation as well. So that's these two peaks right here. That's what we call the K-shell and the L-shell peaks in terms of the characteristic radiation. You can see our video on Bremsstrahlung and characteristics for more information. And the x-rays that are very low energy, they're actually not likely to pass through the tissue and actually get measured on the detector. So we call those not efficient from a dose perspective. Those result in a higher dose if you want to get the same level of image quality. Then also on the other side, if you look down here, like we just talked about in terms of the contrast between the different tissues, the difference in the linear attenuation coefficients is actually small past 25 keV. The contrast out here is relatively low. So again, these x-rays also are not that efficient at making the image. So we would like to actually have more x-rays, which are right down here in the middle around 25 keV. Like we talked about after the x-rays come out of the x-ray tube port, we then have the option to have a filter there. And we use what's called a K-edge filter. In this case, I'm showing you a K-edge filter, which actually is the same material as the anode. And you can see that because this K-edge actually resides right at the same position here is the k-edge in the x-ray generation. This is actually showing you the attenuation of x-rays after this k-edge filter. 
So the x-rays which are out here in this region right here, they're going to be more heavily attenuated by that K-edge filter. And what that's going to result in is it's going to result in fewer of these x-rays out here. And like we talked about, because those x-rays aren't that efficient at generating good image quality, because there's not much contrast between the different soft tissue there, you actually want fewer of those x-rays there. So that's why it's a good thing to have that K-edge filter. So on these systems for mammography, typically they're not going to be the same material for the anode as you'll see in X-ray or CT. So it's typically going to be molybdenum or rhodium. And then the filter as well is going to be molybdenum or rhodium. And there's different subtle trade-offs between those. But just in general, remember it's a different material than on the diagnostic X-ray systems that you're used to. And also these energies in KEV are much lower, right? We're talking about energies in the upper 20s to 30 KEV. If you wanted to optimize a smaller breast, you would have a lower energy to be optimal. And a larger breast, you would have a higher energy to be optimal. But just in general, these energies are so much lower than anything that you're used to from the diagnostic perspective. This is how mammography works from a high level. Next year video on photoelectric and Compton interactions. That's how the x-rays are really interacting with the matter. And that determines the contrast in all of your x-ray and CT imaging.